News Radio 840 WHAS. Good Sunday morning. Bob Sekolder, the Louisville Real Estate Show here with you to the top of the hour. Thank you for joining us, folks. With us uh, for the next half hour, Chuck Crosby, the Crosby Law Offices. Not only does a great job at closing your loan, but he also is involved in a number of other things, including wills. I cannot stress that enough. Powers of attorney and a variety of other things. And you can reach Chuck and his group at 502-499-6360. Also here, Randy Rocky. He is the co-owner of Swan Financial. They do a great job of getting you pre-approved and to the closing table. You can reach Randy at 502-645-0736. My name is Bob Sekoler. I own the Sekoler team over at REMAX Properties East. And we do a pretty good job getting homes sold and closed and also finding homes for buyers. If you'd like to reach out to me, I'll come out and talk to you uh, free. No obligation to consult and talk about what the process is. You can reach me anytime on my cell phone, 502-376-5483. Or you can go to bobsellslouisville.com. First question coming in, guys. Have you noticed some green porch lights on homes this month? Have you had a chance to, have you seen any of those? I asked Sherry just yesterday. Uh, yeah. We saw some and it's like, what's this all about? Yeah. Okay, good. Well, Samantha uh, had the same question. She wrote us an email wondering what the porch lights are, green porch lights. So it's uh, easy to assume that everybody's getting a head start on Christmas decorating, but there's actually a significance that has nothing to do with the holiday season. Americans using green porch lights show support for U.S. military veterans. The idea began as part of an initiative called Greenlight, a vet project. That's according to that campaign. The simple action of changing one light to green is intended to spark a national conversation regarding the recognition of veterans and green light them forward as valued members of our community. So there you go. I'm going to try to find I don't, I don't know who sells green lights, but I'll do a search on Amazon. I'll go to the big box stores locally, try to put a couple of green lights in mind as well. I think it's important to say thank you to our vets. Moving forward, this is for you, Chuck. It's actually a two-part question. Chuck Crosby at the law, Crosby Law Offices. Uh, Grandma Sarah quick claimed her $500,000 home in Oldham County to her grandson, Arnold, two years ago. So he's writing us in this email. She recently passed away owing $100,000 on the mortgage. I guess, Randy, you could be involved in this too. So Arnold's wondering, is he responsible for paying off the mortgage since it was in her name and the deed was put into his name only? So the answer to that first leg is yes, absolutely. Uh, if you have a lien on a house and then the property transfers, that lien stays on that house. Uh, we have what they call a race notice state. Right. It's basically whoever gets there first and puts the uh, notice of the encumbrance in, uh, that's going to uh, uh, be the first lien, as it were. Um, so she had a mortgage on the property. The deed comes after. That mortgage transfers with the property. Parenthetically, can the mortgage company, upon hearing of uh, Arnold's grandma's passing away, cancel the mortgage and demand payoff for it? Most mortgages, and it depends on from which lender they are and uh, which form they use, uh -huh. uh, either paragraph 13 or paragraph 21 will typically be what we call the due on sale clause. Mm. That is to say, if someone transfers a beneficial interest in the property, a beneficial interest means you have a legal interest in the property. So you call it a contract for deed, call it a bond for deed, call it whatever you will. If you transfer a beneficial interest in the property to another entity, then the loan could come due. Now, typically it doesn't as long as the mortgage keeps getting paid, uh, though I have seen it on some VA loans and some other loans where property is transferred and then they do call it. Uh, so they have the ability uh, to call the loan. Okay. So let me recap. Grandma Sarah quit claimed her $500,000 home in Oldham County to her grandson, Arnold, who is writing us, and this happened two years ago. Now, Arnold says that his cousin recently put the house that Grandma Sarah deeded to him on the market, and there's a real estate agent trying to sell it. So now Arnold's wondering, so what does he do from here? Well, um, if you own a piece of property that somebody else is trying to sell, 
you might want to show a copy of that deed to the realtor and say, hey, mm-hmm. they don't own the property. Now, uh, most realtors will check that thing out before they right. sign up a contract to make sure that they've got the actual seller. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's the way you go. If you've got a deed, uh, <laughs> they can't sell the property out from underneath of you. Now, uh, normally that kind of stuff will come up at a closing. It's not it happens every now and again to where we'll uh, be given a contract. We run the title. We find out that the name listed on the contract is not the actual owner of the property. Mm-hmm. That's when we contact the parties involved and say, hey, what's going on now? A lot of the time, you know, they just, uh, oh, that's the power of attorney or, oh, that's the trustee. And they just didn't set it up on the contract correctly. Uh, but in this case, another party cannot sell the property out from under you. Uh, it's there's just a, a paper trail a mile wide there. Yep. And I should tell you, we and a lot of other realtors will do exactly what Chuck says before we yeah. list a house. We'll check on PVA and make sure that uh, the names are correct before we go forward. So be rest assured that that's not a, a typical thing that happens. If you would like to see a replay of this show and actually see it because we put it up on YouTube, you can go to LouisvilleAnswers.com. That's LouisvilleAnswers.com. And if you want to hear what sellers are saying about us, we do videos as well talking to our sellers at closing, you can go to LouisvilleSellersTalk.com. Over to Randy Rocky, Swan Financial. Uh, Lisa is thinking about buying a manufactured home. So she's wondering, do you finance them? And what are the guidelines? I know this is kind of a tricky scale here, right? Yes, it is. And, and uh, yes, we do. Uh, and they need, we can even do single wides uh, trailers if they're, I think it's March of 1997. It has to be after that. Uh, it has to be manufactured, but it has to be on a permanent foundation. And what they mean by a permanent foundation is somewhat difficult at times. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I consider a permanent foundation where you have, you know, an actual footer or block and you you screw to that at that modular home or manufacturer home to that where it doesn't it, it's just not an open area underneath the uh, actual trailer and they just have like little bods or something that that holds it down so technically that, having that's it the tied only... down is what i think the term that i would use right is that what you would use right. tied, down? Uh, tied down but it has to be defined in a certain way tied down and uh-huh. we have to have sometimes you have to get an engineer involved to if, if you have wheels underneath it it's not going to go for a mortgage right no it yeah. is not yeah i thought so all right so that that thank you for that that uh helps there's an well. added uh part to that Bob. oh go for it um the uh, modulars, mobiles, they're all considered personal property, like mm-hmm. a car, mm-hmm. okay? That's why they have to be tied down. Now, you can do a mortgage when they're tied down, but typically the lenders will ask me on my end of the deal uh, to do an affidavit of conversion. That is to say, you you uh, relinquish the title, you surrender the title, you swear to an, aff- an affidavit that the property is permanently affixed to the ground, and then you file that all with the county clerk's office. That's when it becomes part of the real estate. Now, when you buy a house, uh, you're not really buying a house. What you're doing is you're buying a piece of ground that has a house on it. If it's just a modular or a mobile home, it's like buying a piece of ground with a car on it. Mm. Cars can obviously get up and go. So that's why the mortgage companies will have us do the surrendering of the title, the affidavit of conversion, and then it all gets filed with the county clerk's office. It's not unusual when we're doing properties out in the uh, outer counties to come across a deed where there's supposed to be a home on it, but there's there's it's a, it was a mobile home that never got surrendered. And mm. all they did was transfer the deed. Well, the transferring a deed on a mobile home or a modular until it's been converted. If it has not been converted, you're just selling ground. You're not selling the actual trailer. Out of curiosity, when you buy a home, it's immediate. Is there a when you buy a mobile home or at least a modular? Is there a three day right of rescission no. before it becomes no? Home? Okay, that right. Everybody thinks that. Uh, they also think that with the car, uh, only door to door sales and um, refinances of a personal residence fall under that mm. three-day right of rescission. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons, cool stories from uh, you know the Appalachian Mountains as to why that's the case. But uh, yeah, unless the car dealer or the mobile home dealer knocked on your door cold calling you and got you to buy while he's doing that door-to-door, you know, it's, a, it's carved in stone when you do the deal. I uh, got it. Good. We're moving on. Did you know, by the way, that our Socolor team offers our clients the use of a free moving truck? It's true. If you're a buyer or seller, you can use it for free. 
For more information, simply call me 376-5483. We go back over to Randy for a quick update question. Elizabeth planning to move to Italy next year, and she's wondering in this email that she sent me, is it possible to get a mortgage for a property in a foreign country if she wants to have a f house in Italy and still live in the United States and commute back and forth? It is. Uh, uh, we we don't do them, and there's not many companies that do them in Italy, uh, besides you know banks and um, actual companies in Italy. So, yeah. but but what you can do if she wanted to keep it maybe less complicated, if she could uh, take out, uh, if she could do a cash out refinance on her current home here, and just take that cash and buy it in Italy, if if it could cover the the whole purchase of the home. That might be a good idea. Okay, Elizabeth, hopefully that helps you. We move back over to Chuck Crosby at the Crosby Law Office. James lives in an apartment, and he's thinking about buying a home next year. He sent us an email saying he, he noticed just how they misspelled his name on the lease of his apartment. So he's got this lease. It's smel spelled incorrectly, and he is wondering, is the lease still valid? If not, he says he wants to start looking for a home immediately. Chuck? Okay. Um, yeah, no, a misprint like that is not going to void the lease unless – uh, his name is Bob, and the lease spells it as Chuck. Uh, <laughs> as, as long as it's, you know, his name and somebody Close. just misspelled it. Okay. You know, uh, the idea is paper doesn't change reality. Okay. Uh, if he signed off on it, uh, that's that's not going to go anywhere. That's a valid lease. All right. This question is for both Chuck and Randy. Uh, Thomas writing in, he, he's saying, what are the closing costs? And who pays them? He's a first-time home buyer. He listens to our show every week. What are closing costs and who pays them? Randy, you want to start with the mortgage side of it first, and then we'll go to Chuck since he's the follow-up. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So on the mortgage side, like in our closing costs are typically uh, uh, credit report. Uh, we do have a processing fee, and uh, if we have to do a verification appointment, and uh, that's part of the, of the closing cost, and then title, which I'll let Chuck handle. Chuck, go for it. All right. Well, without giving specific numbers, yep. uh, I'm going to put out the proviso there that since my name is on the front door, I pretty much have undercut everybody else in town. Oh, there uh, you go. I love that so, plug. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. so there we go. Uh, but anyhow, there's going to be a closing and title exam. OK, that's a set fee. We're a little bit less than everybody else, but most of the fees are are comparable. So you, uh, that's going to be on the buyer side. So the buyer is going to pay for a title exam closing fee. There's going to be title insurance. There's going to be tax on it. There's going to be recording fees. OK, uh, and depending on the contract, of course, uh, typically there'll be proration of taxes depending on the, the time of year. It'll go from one side to the other. Um, on the seller side, we charge a closing fee and a uh, doc prep fee. Now, those fees are way lower than what the buyer pays. But we do work uh, uh, that benefits the uh, seller. So uh, we charge the uh, closing uh, fee, the doc prep fee. There'll be a transfer tax of a dollar per thousand. That, of course, goes to the county clerk. I'm sorry, as the county clerk will always say, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, 50 cents per 500, not a dollar per thousand. That's great. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyhow, uh, and typically we'll charge an overnight fee if we have to get payoffs out, stuff like that. Um, but those are roughly the fees. And uh, if anybody has any particular questions on what a deal would cost, just call me. Uh, we give out uh, quotes every day. And we're going to give that number in just a second, folks. So just stand by for that when we come back more of your questions. And a follow-up to what you're about to hear in a moment on the new Swan commercial that's going to air. We'll check in with Randy on that. Again, Randy Rocky, Swan Financial, continuing with us at 645-0736. Chuck Crosby, the owner of the, as he says, the Crosby Law Offices, his name's on the, on the door. You can reach him for closings. Yes, you can pick the closing attorney that you want. Also, he does powers of attorney, wills, which are so important. He works with commissioner sales, foreclosure defenses, a variety of things. You can reach Chuck at 499-6360. And if you're thinking of selling your home or even buying, I am here available for you to come out. Free consultation, no obligation. You give me a call. I will be there. We can talk about the process now, next year, or the years beyond. You can reach me at 502-376-5483 or go to bobsellslouisville.com. We are back in a moment on News Radio 840 WHAS. News Radio 840 WHAS. Thank you, Barbara Corcoran, for your endorsement. Barbara from Shark Tank fame and a variety of other things, and we thank her. She's a mentor and a very nice lady, and we really like working with her. 
Uh, just a reminder here with us, Randy Rocky, Swan Financial, 6450736. Also, it's uh, Chuck Crosby, the Crosby Law Office, who does closings and a variety of other things, including wills. And you can reach Chuck at 499-6360. And I'm Bob Sekolder, owner of the Sekolder team, REMAX Properties East. You can reach me if you're thinking about selling now or in the future or buying. You can reach me at 502-376-5483. Or we'll go to bobsellslouisville.com. So, Randy, in the uh, break, the commercial talks about now there's a new plan that you've come up with, which I think is brilliant, which will actually reduce the interest rate from yes. wherever it is now. And it fluctuates, and right. but it will bring it down. Is it four points from where it is? Uh, it's 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 two points on a 30-year fixed. <laughs> okay. Yes. So, uh, uh, real quick on this, it's, so right now we're looking at a five and a half percent APR, five point six two NMLS number two six three six two. So we're at a five and a half percent rate, thirty year fixed product. And how we do that, and it's very common in the industry, is we have the seller help pay some of the closing cost. And uh, I can explain that more to you, but right now the yep. typical market right now is around seven and a half. So we're very excited to roll this out and we're going to roll it out in a big way. Um, and actually, Bob, you're the first one to really, we're rolling it out here. Yeah. And again, you, you didn't hear uh, in, incorrectly, you heard right five and a half and it fluctuates based on what the going rate is, but uh, it's two points off what is the going rate that you'll find anywhere else. So keep, uh, we'll give uh, Brandy's number out again in a second. Back over to uh, Chuck Crosby with the Crosby Law Offices. Uh, Matthew and his girlfriend bought a house together four years ago with this email. Uh, they're writing in saying, this should be a red flag, by the way, to anybody who is thinking about buying a house with a spouse. Well, not so much spouse, but girlfriend, boyfriend, that type of thing. Matthew says his girlfriend has never made a payment on the mortgage and no longer lives there. And Matthew, who listens to the show, thanks, Matt, for listening, he says uh, that they bought the house as tenants in common. So he's wondering, the girlfriend's gone. Uh, apparently, they're both on the deed and uh, the mortgage, but she's never made the payment, so he's been making the payment. So Chuck Crosby over at the Crosby Law Offices. So what do you suggest? What should Matt do at this point? Well, I can't tell you exactly what to do on this. What I can say is that it kind of is a study in in, in a very problematic area. Mm -hmm. uh, Kentucky has laws dividing property between spouses, but not between boyfriends and girlfriends. This is the same thing as if, uh, you know, you and I just went in partners on a piece of property and put our names on the deed. Right. Uh, if we don't uh, act fairly towards each other, then that's a lawsuit. Now, in this particular case, he's living there. He's been making all the payments. Uh, you know, if they were a married couple, the courts would take all this into uh, um, into consideration. But uh, in this case, uh, he'd have to try and file a suit to, for partition to have the property divided up. But the fact of the matter is she owns half of it. He owns half of it. Nothing's going to happen without her. Now, the fact that it's tenants in common, that just relates to what happens if one of them passes. Mm -hmm. um, namely, if she passes, it doesn't go 100 percent to him uh, in, as most of these deeds are set up in joint survivorship where uh, they own the property 50-50. If one passes, the other owns it 100%. Tenants in common, they own it 50-50. If one of them passes, it goes to their heirs. Mm. Uh, so uh, that could be all, you know, if she has children, it could go to the children. Uh, if not the children, then to her parents. If not her parents, then her siblings. I mean, there's it can get very convoluted. The thing is, um, if he wants to get the property uh, partitioned, uh, it's possible under certain circumstances, but again, you got to meet those circumstances. Mm -hmm. Got it. All right. So this is a warning to any boyfriend, girlfriend, parents of kids who might be boyfriend, girlfriend. Before you do anything like this, where you buy a home together, make sure you consult an attorney like Chuck Cross, because Chuck, you can put together some paperwork that has teeth. Yeah, in it. there's there's paperwork that can be put together. But uh, when I see this, normally it's, uh, you know, oh, this is my girlfriend. We're going to get married. Um, mm -hmm. No, she's not putting down anything or no, he's not putting down anything. The loan's only in, you know, one of their names. I mean, that's just a recipe for disaster. Yeah, uh, I, I agree completely. 
A reminder, if you want to see a replay of this show, because we do this on video and going to YouTube, you can go to LouisvilleAnswers.com. This may be a topic that we just uh, broached uh, that you might discuss, want to discuss with uh, kids that uh, are maybe in a relationship. Also, if you want to see some of uh, our past shows and also questions, I break out of uh, these uh, radio shows. I break it into questions and we put that back up and you can go to LouisvilleHomesTV.com. That's Louisville homestv.com over to randy rocky swan financial mary will be a first-time home buyer and she writes in this email what exactly is a down payment and how much does she actually need so we're getting a lot of first-time home buyers which is very encouraging because rents keep going up that's a problem and people are going to want to start buying and of course there's a lot of questions out there we're all hoping that the market improves uh, in 2024 so randy down payment and how much does in this case mary need for a down payment uh, she doesn't need any down payment. Uh, it, now, if we can get her in a situation where she puts a down payment down, the interest rates better, and obviously her payments better. So there are a couple of options with that. So she can put as little as 3% down or 3.5% down if we're going to do an actual down payment, but there is a lot of zero money down home options. Hmm. So that's that's great news. But the, give us the, the definition of down payment so everybody knows. I know there's a lot of us who do know, but for those who don't. Right. So on a down payment, for example, on a $200,000 house at 3%, you would have to bring $6,000 to the closing table if you have a, if you bring 3%. So that's a definition, I guess, of a down payment. You have well, a down payment on the property and then your yeah. balance would be 194000 I think also another definition might be that is a lump sum of money that you are putting down to show the bank that you have some skin, so to speak, an interest in the home. That if you were yes. to, to walk away, you would lose this amount of money. You would that lose you, that, yes. That money that's as a down payment. That's so, correct. Yeah. Okay. Which is which is more more of a reason why the interest rate is higher with a no down payment right. because they feel like there's more risk because they don't have skin in the game. Yep, exactly. We go back over to Chuck Crosby over at the Crosby Law Offices. Lisa has an interesting question. In this email, she says her dad is 82. He's in a nursing home, and he wants to leave Lisa and her sister the home. The house that he owns, he'll put it in his will. But there are some outstanding debts on the house, including about $100,000 on the mortgage and taxes that need to be paid. And Lisa says her dad does not think he can leave her the house because the mortgage tax liens against the house are there. That's not exactly true, right? No, not Chuck? at all true. Yeah, yeah, you can leave, you know, anybody, anything. It's just that, as we mentioned earlier in the show, those liens follow the property. Mm -hmm. If they're on the property, uh, a person has left that property uh, in a will. Well, um, the will can say that the estate will pay the mortgage, but it typically doesn't. Nine times out of 10, the will's going to say that the uh, debt goes with the property. Uh, so it's just a matter of she got a house and that house has liens on it. Easy enough. And we yeah. should point out. So let's say, Lisa, you don't have you've got the liens, you got to pay off the mortgage. You don't have the money to do any of that to make those payments. Uh, this is kind of self-interest, but I will tell you, it's not necessarily um, uh, difficult for you to do. List the house and sell it. And hopefully you'll come out with cash and also pay off the debt that takes you forward and you've got some money in your pocket. So There's also another angle, Bob. Yeah, go ahead. Um, if if it's willed to her and she is, in fact, an heir, uh, there's federal regulations that say the bank has to look at her and say, yeah, you can keep paying that mortgage. Remember how before we talked about the due on sale clause? Right. Wouldn't apply here. Hmm. OK, so she could, in fact, keep paying the mortgage. Now, there's forms to fill out and the bank can be a little bit uh, hard to deal with in filling out those forms. I've never heard anybody said it was easy, uh, but can, in fact, if you are a um, uh, family member, that sort of thing, if you fit the definitions that they're looking for, uh, you can just keep the mortgage going. What happens okay. to the tax liens in that scenario, Chuck? Do they have to well, pay them off or do they just go with it? Well, like the there's, they go with it. They go. With okay. It. okay. Uh, now it could be, uh, and has happened in some cases that I'm involved in, uh, where um, some where the taxing entity will make a claim against the estate for those taxes. Okay, because the tax is a personal liability. So the taxing entity could, in fact, say, "Hey, I want the money from the estate," and then it goes out in that direction. Normally, though, normally when I see it, um, it's just it's just the properties transfer uh, with all the liens attached. All right. Got it. A reminder, you want to see what the sellers and buyers are saying about us in writing. You can go to LouisvilleZillow.com or LouisvilleGoogle.com. This question goes over to Randy Rocky. James planning to buy his first home next year. 
uh, and his potential mortgage lender says he's going to need PMI. So another looks like first time home buyer. He's wondering what is PMI? Right. It's, it's a private mortgage insurance and it goes in on any property where you do not put a 20 percent down payment. So, uh, uh, for example, if you are buying a two hundred thousand dollar home and you don't put forty thousand down, then there will be a private mortgage insurance in that scenario. There are a few nuances where you don't have to do it, but ninety nine percent of the houses that close have PMI if you don't put at least twenty percent down of what the purchase price of, of the house is. Got it. A final question here. This one's for Chuck Crosby over at the Crosby Law Office. Michael's sending us an interesting question via email. And by the way, you can send your questions as well to me, bob at we sell Louisville.com. Put radio question in the subject line and then in the body of the email, send me the question itself. And Michael's asking, is there a window of time where he can pull out of a contract? So I guess he's saying he signs a contract can he pull out or negate it at any time after he has officially signed it? Chuck? It sounds like we're going back to the other question that we had. No, uh, that's there's not a specific time frame where you can say, no, nah, I didn't mean it. Um, now, there are usually contingencies, like on mm -hmm. most contracts that you write, Bob, after the inspection period, if the inspection is not set, you know, satisfactory, you can bail at that point. But an absolute, oh, hey, I have X number of days to just get out of any contract I sign. No, nah, it's not a thing. Not a, it's, but it is easy for the first few days because you can pull out on inspection, you, right? And and that's an easy one to go. You, uh, they're varying but areas. Yeah. yeah, but you also have to remember it has to be in good faith. You can't just walk up and say, "Oh, I see a dog hair. This is not satisfactory." Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, there actually has to be some basis. Otherwise, you know, the other side could say, "Hey, you're not acting in good faith," and that would negate that action. I but, will tell you, yes, but I've seen where the buyer yeah. gets cold feet and they just simply call. Oh, I know they're home. looking for anything. I get that phone call all the yeah. time. Oh, hey, I want to get out of this contract. Can I tell them? Yada yada yada. And it's like, no, that's that's bad. Well, what if I go out and I put all this debt on my name? No, you're acting in bad faith. If you yeah. do something to sabotage it, that's bad faith. I saw um, spider web. Spider web. Ah! <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Not, not going to help. Yeah, I got you. All right. So our thanks as we wrap up here, uh, here in November again to our friends Chuck Crosby, the Crosby Law Offices. You can reach Chuck for not only your closing, but also wills. And that's important. Powers of attorney, commissioner sales, foreclosure defense, and the list goes on and on. Um, landlord tenant disputes. You can reach Chuck 499 6360. Also, Randy Rocky, who is over at Swan Financial at 502 645 0736. And yes, you heard there's a way to get your interest rate down in the fives right now. And you'll call Randy, he'll give you the full scoop 645 0736. And if you're thinking of selling or buying now or in the next year or year beyond, I would love to help you. All you need to do is call me. It's for a free, no obligation, no cost. I'll come out. We'll talk. Um, or I can do it by phone or via Zoom. But it, whatever works for you. Uh, but uh, in person works the best. You can reach me anytime on my cell phone, 376-5483. Or go to bobsellslouisville.com. We're out of time. See you next Sunday, folks, on News Radio 840 WHAS.